The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. I am Stacy Graham. I'm going to be doing a session on historical empathy. So let's talk about Christopher Columbus. Let's talk about this image of Christopher Columbus. Columbus taking possession of the new world. When do you think this image was created? Huh? After the event. After the event? OK, so anywhere between now and 1492. <laughs> That's a good place to start. Can we narrow it down even further? Say, probably when he got back to Europe in 1493 and explained all of his uh, wonderful exploits, somebody probably put it to print. 1600s? Okay, okay, we're uh... The color printing, like maybe early 20th century, I mean, there's, I don't know if you guys can see it, there's a caption underneath it, published by the Prang Corporation Educational in Boston, USA. Okay, so he's sitting a little closer, he can see a little bit more detail. Boston not around yet in, 19, in 1493. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you. This is actually not a primary source for Columbus, because this was made in 1892. So uh, what do you think it is a primary source for? Spanish justification for what they were doing? Spanish justification? Well, this is an American print, right? It's from Boston, 400 years after Columbus's first voyage. Manifest destiny? Ah, maybe it's related to that. What do you think that the people of America thought about Columbus in 1892, according to this lithograph? Heroic. OK, so what are the clues that make you think that he's heroic? Well, he's in the forefront. You can really see him. All right, yeah, let's, let's do the art history thing. OK, we have the focal point. What else? Sword in hand. Sword in hand. He's also kneeling. Kneeling, yeah. Dramatic pose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's very dramatic. It's clothed. It's very Elegantly clothed. Elegantly clothed. Yeah, clothes are better than Everyone's looking down at him. Well, that wouldn't make more sense. Everyone's a little bit subordinate to him, for sure. They're all standing, for one thing. He's the one carrying the cooler flag. All right, he's got the standard. Very nice. OK, so and of course, there's something very important about 1892, and that was the year that um, the lobbying to have Columbus Day uh, was done. And it was done, actually, as a political move to get the votes of Italian Americans, who at that time were immigrating to the United States in droves. So there's a lot of layers going on there. But you can see that this is, this is actually how we thought of Columbus a very long time. And when you learned about Columbus when you were growing up, you may have learned about him in this way. Nowadays, a little bit of a different story. So some of you may be familiar with the movements to change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Now, does anyone know anything about this and can fill us in a little bit more? It's basically a recognition that Columbus's arrival for the native populations of, of the Americas at the time was the beginning of um, what, yeah, would have been described as genocide. I mean, either the willful extermination by European colonists and their descendants, or the uh, unwitting extermination through introducing new diseases that resulted in a huge population die-off. Um, like millions were dead within a couple of decades, within a generation. Yeah, yeah, the numbers are staggering. So instead of thinking about Columbus, oh, he sailed, the, you know, 1492, he sailed the ocean blue. Uh, he was a hero who discovered America and it proved the world was round. Uh, those things may be a little bit inaccurate, but we're taking, um, we're taking that narrative of Columbus 
and turning it on its head, uh, saying, well, actually, what Columbus brought was death, disease, and genocide. And there was a big movement, particularly among you know, Native Americans, to be like, no, this was, this was a bad thing. You, I mean, sure, it's a, a very layered, very complex, but portraying Columbus as some one-dimensional hero is not the way to go about this, because there's a lot of non-heroic parts to this story. And this is happening with a lot of these figures that we've learned about in history, um, that uh, like the founding fathers and, and all sorts of people that we're learning a not so savory part of their story. Yes, ma'am. When we were learning about this in my seventh grade class, my kids were like, wait a second, isn't this like the Mongols and the Vikings? And so they equated Christopher Columbus with the Mongols taking over in China and with the Vikings taking over. Like the people at the time were probably scared to death. And it was interesting to see them view that from another point of view. Yeah, yeah. They're, the, the younger generation is growing up knowing this version of Columbus. Um, so, it means that some of these things are difficult to teach. Uh, it means that there are a lot of competing narratives. It means, okay, um, how do we talk about important people in history uh, when we're at the same time trying to move away from the dead white man model and, and trying to be a bit more inclusive, but how do we do it without sounding like we're bashing the founding fathers or other, you know, people that are important parts of the American narrative. So uh, there's a lot of hard choices to be made. And so we're going to approach this not as Columbus was good guy or bad guy. That is not the point. We are not here to categorize historical figures as good guys or bad guys. We are here to understand as much as we can about them in the context of the time period in which they lived. And so one way to do this is historical empathy. So what is historical empathy? How would you define it? Learning the context of what you're, what you're teaching. Yeah. Learning the context around this person uh, that you're trying to come up with some sort of perspective on. And it is not actually putting yourself in someone else's shoes. It's not actually, well, imagine you were a native indigenous person in the Caribbean and you saw Columbus's ship sail up and you know because we can't ever really put our heads into those people uh, because we don't have enough sources and there's just too many years of history for us to really understand what they would have thought so it's not this imagined history it's trying to understand what's going on at the time to be able to put these people in context and have them make sense judging them by what is going on at the time. Now, why is this important? Oh, before I move on to why this is important, here's a really good uh, definition that I use uh, because this is actually quoted in this book by Bruce Lesh called Why Won't You Just Tell Us the Answer? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar <laughs> with that one, but it's a pretty good book and I actually use it when I teach historical thinking every fall. And this is a class where all of my students are future high school history teachers. So they're trying to learn the same things that you all learned. Anyway, and so he quotes Peter J. Lee saying, historical empathy is the understanding of past institutions, social practices, or actions as making sense in the light of way people saw things. It is not just having the inert knowledge that people saw things the way they did, but also being able to use that knowledge to make sense of what was done. So understanding that everyone has a different perspective, but that perspective does not just float around in a vacuum. It is rooted in a particular time period that will make it make more sense. So historical empathy is trying to make a person's decision make more sense. And I did kind of an alternate version of an historical empathy um, activity using Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears because Andrew Jackson is another one of these figures that is part hero, part villain. 
uh, depending on who's telling the story. Uh, and when you talk about the Trail of Tears, I think we can all agree that that is a black chapter in American history, a uh, dark chapter. And so a lot of people heap a lot of blame on Andrew Jackson for that, like he's the sole person uh, to blame for that. And yes, he made this decision, but how does his decision make sense in the 1830s? And so that was kind of what that is based on, and I'll be developing further um, versions of that, and eventually it'll make its way into a, a lesson plan on our page. Now it's important because, for one thing, it's a part of the new social studies practice standards that are part of the new package of curriculum standards that are going to be implemented for everybody. So, um, and, and these are great, these social studies practice standards, because these are the skills and strategies that go along with all the different content standards. So, um, there is a, a set of them for geographical awareness, and there's a set of them for historical awareness. And so from the, from the ones for historical awareness, uh, this is the one that specifically asks you to teach historical empathy. So perceiving and presenting past events and issues as they might have been experienced by the people of the time with historical empathy rather than present-minded. So getting your students to not think about things from their 21st century mindsets. We know what happened in history. We know what, was the, what were the consequences of these decisions. And therefore, we are going to judge these people based on what we know now. That's, that's not what we want your students to do. We want them to use historical empathy rather than that presentism, that present-mindedness where they get to feel all high and mighty because they know how it turned out. Well, what decisions are we making today that we don't know how are gonna turn out? And we are also going to use a current standard today during this activity, analyze why European countries were motivated to explore including religion, political rivalry, and economic gains. So we're gonna touch on that standard through this activity. All right. So I said I was going to get back to this image. Now this image, unlike the one you saw before, is from the time period of Columbus's discoveries. Uh, he went in 1492. He came back, tried to get more money for another voyage. And when he came back, he wrote about, well, actually, before he came back, he wrote this letter to Ferdinand and Isabella, his sponsors, of course that was describing what he saw and what they did. And this is a fascinating letter. So I know that in your standards you have to read an excerpt from his journal. That's another really interesting source. But this one is also really cool. And uh, I know, don't, don't, don't worry yet. I know it's in Latin, OK? Uh, not only is it in Latin, it's in this horrible uh, fracture uh, Gothic hand. But this is 1493. And so when it was published in Europe, his letter came back it was published in Europe, and this is uh, a certain edition where they added these woodcuts. Now, woodcuts were the like, premier way of illustrating things at the time. And so this isn't the only one. So if you look at this online, uh, you can see all the other pictures included with this, and it's really quite cool. But this is, I mean, which one is Columbus? What's the focal point here? How is this portrayal? of the encounter different from the one we saw before. I mean, these are all things that you can do uh, with your students in your classroom. Uh, you know, how are the, the natives portrayed in this one, for example? All right, I'm just gonna show you, because this is hyperlinked to uh, where you can get it. This is um, available through the World Digital Library. The Library of Congress is one of the main partners on this website. So for world history teachers, this website is a godsend. And so you can look all through it See some of the other images associated with it? It's a very short letter. But we still can't read the text, right? Let's get to an edition that we can read. Here's one. OK, now this is also available through the Library of Congress website, where they send you to a link that shows up in um, one of those archive.org uh, books that are all public domain. So this is where you have that text. and. It is in nice, readable English. Yay. 
does not have the wood. Oh, it does. Look at that. It has the woodcuts as well. Fantastic. So this is what it, the facsimile version. And then after this, they have the um, translation. Hooray. OK. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to read an excerpt on a worksheet so you don't have to look at the screen. And it's split into four different parts. And each part comes with a little question that refers to something in that portion. So this is something that is done for seventh grade students. All right. Now, like I said, this is not an actual lesson plan posted to our website yet. So the only way that if you want a copy of this worksheet, you can get it currently is to email me and I'll be happy to send it to you. So let's go through this. Would somebody like to volunteer to read the very first chunk on page one? They also traded cotton and gold for pieces of bows, bottles, jugs, and jars like persons without reason, which I forbade because it was very wrong. And I gave to them many beautiful and pleasing things that I had brought with me, no value being taken in exchange, in order that I might uh, the more easily make them friendly to me, that they might be made worshipers of Christ, and that they might be full of love towards our king, queen, and prince, and the whole Spanish nation. Also, that they might be zealous to search out and collect and deliver to us these things of which they had plenty and which we greatly needed. Thank you, sir. So why did Columbus treat the Indians fairly when exchanging gifts? Or what he considered to be fair? Yes. Well, I would say <coughs> as an initial building of a positive relationship, okay. uh, just you know, right off the bat, kind of a, a universal custom. OK. He's also buttering them up to exploit them later. To exploit. OK. Exploit, and specifically, how is he going to exploit them based on what we learned in this passage. He wants there. more stuff. He wants, wants the good he stuff. He wants resources that they, they need stuff. And they have plenty of them. They have plenty of them. He wants to convert them. That was the thing. He wants to convert them to Christianity. All right. He wants to convert them to Christianity. OK. Uh, so yes, he's treating them fairly because, for one thing, this is a goodwill gesture to start off uh, this kind of relationship of exchange. And in a way, it might, okay, maybe this is just me, but I also got the impression that it'd be like, you know, shooting fish in a barrel, right? To treat them unfairly because they are acting without reason. So it's almost like a, a little bit paternalistic here. In the, you know, well, we're going to be fair to them because it would just be too easy to treat them unfairly here. He wants them to be good, good uh, now good citizens of Spain for which he was claiming their land for. Yes. All right, good. Now, who wants to read this second chunk for me? For all of us. I think it might be worthy noting also that the Indians thought they were getting a very good deal also. <clears throat> yes. They yes. weren't necessarily thinking they're just on the receiving end of a bad deal. Okay, but we don't know what the Indians thought from their point of view from this. That's true. Right. But that is something that you have background Could on. Could we surmise that they were happy with the exchange of goods? Well, I don't see any kind of indication of unhappiness uh, on anybody's part yet. But why Let's would you see. write about it if you, you wouldn't want to write to the king or queen that you had trouble, so you wouldn't want to tell Ah, them. well, of course we want to discuss purpose. We'll, we'll hold that on. We'll hold on to that to the end. We'll hold on to that to the end. Good. I'm glad your brain's going there, though. Well, let's go ahead and go through these chunks. So who wants to read the second one? These people practice no kind of idolatry. On the contrary, they firmly believe that all strength and power, and in fact, all good things are in heaven, and that I come down from thence with these ships and sailors. In this belief, I was received there after they put aside fear. Nor are they slow or unskilled, but of excellent and acute understanding. And the men who have navigated that sea gave an account of everything in an admiral manner. But they never saw people clothed nor these kinds of ships. Okay, thank you. Why would the Indians be good candidates for converting to Christianity? They were smart and skilled. All right, they, they were smart, they were intelligent. 
They already had a sense of belief. No idolatry. All right, they, they weren't uh, worshiping what Columbus and his fellow Spaniards would have considered to be idols. So it wasn't like you had to clean that slate blank first before you put something else on top of it. They already kind of had this belief that all strength and power are in heaven, or at least that was the impression that Columbus had after his first initial dealings with them. And also they managed to put aside their fear in dealing with him too. So if they're not like scared and running away, that, that might help. So let's move to the third section. As soon as I reached the sea, I seized by force several Indians on the first island in order that they might learn from us and in like manner tell us about those things in these lands of which they themselves had knowledge. And the plan succeeded, for in a short time we understood them and they us, sometimes by gestures and signs, sometimes by words, and it was a great advantage to us. Thank you. Why does seizing by force several Indians not seem like a big deal to Columbus in this passage? Greater good. Okay, and what is the greater good here? They, you can learn from them. They might learn okay. from them. Okay, uh, this them. is how we're gonna learn from each other. He's building a, a base. He's building a base of people, so like I, I'm getting a few to learn my language and you learn your language, and so then you'll go out and tell your people that we're really nice people. Right. He's establishing what the basis of communication is going to be, because obviously, neither speaks the other's language. He seems very optimistic at how that language acquisition is going, which seems a little too good to be true. I'm wondering just how well he is being understood, but then we don't know. Um, well, and he also had permission to do that from the Vatican 50 years earlier when Pope <laughs> Nicholas wrote the first paper full. Yes, I love the foreshadowing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. This was not just something that he decided in the spur of the moment. This is something that was already an okay thing for him to do. And this was actually going to be for, th for their own good. Excuse me. It hurts to say that. He is yes. going to make them like the Spaniards instead of leaving Spaniards behind who might become more like natives. Right. The only side that's going to go native here is that the Indians are going to be, because there's this sense there, that implication that one civilization is clearly superior. All right. Last section. Volunteer. Thank you. They are coming with me now, yet always believing that I descended from heaven, although they have been living with us for a long time and are living with us today. And these men were the first who announced it wherever we landed, continually proclaiming to the others in a loud voice, come, come, and you will see the celestial people. All right. Now, celestial might be a word you have to define for your seventh grade students, but I think they'll get it. Um, according to Columbus, how do the Indians feel about the Spaniards? How does that contribute to his overall justification for his actions? Because part of historical empathy is figuring out how do these people justify their actions? The Indians feel that the Spaniards are from heaven. They're celestial. They're like, the Indians are like almost a perfect, because celestial kind of has a perfection to it as well. Okay, so if the Indians considered the Spaniards to be somewhat divine, that obviously kind of plays into the Spaniards' hands a little bit in getting them to cooperate. They looked different. They had different things. They had technology that the Indians didn't have. They did look like gods. Right, it'd be like if aliens landed and had like 25th century technology okay it'd be like if the uss enterprise landed and and you know the klingons came. i don't know but uh we would we would probably feel a little bit inferior and of course a lot bit scared it's amazing that these indians got over that fear or at least the ones that he is talking about got over that fear because if aliens landed with superior technology i guarantee you we'd bring out the nukes Right? Isn't that what happens in the But you don't think that was the purpose of taking the group uh, <coughs> first island? So teach them, teach a few of them my, our ways and get them used to it, and then as we land on the next group and we meet the next group of Indians, we have people that already you have, they know with right. us that can talk good about us. Hey, look at all what we... That is very smart. Don't it's take PR. our word for it. It's good PR. 
Take their word for it. Yeah. And so you're always building that. So when they first met as, I mean, at the natives, as warriors, they would not have been, they, they, couldn't have, they couldn't have justified fear either. So they're putting their game face on. I mean, would not any, any nation that has warriors, wouldn't you not put your game face on? You wouldn't show your fear. So they'd be it's going to the situation saying, hey, we're not afraid, I got this. So that's probably the way it's seen as well. It's, that might be something to think about. Again, we don't have any kind of things that give us an, an exact impression from the Indian's point of view yet. It's all from the Spaniard's point of view. So that makes it kind of hard. Now, I do want to get back to this idea of kind of author's purpose that somebody brought up earlier. So let's remind ourselves what the purpose of this letter was. Of course, a letter written to Isabella and Ferdinand, uh, king and queen of Castile and Spain. Um, Castile, Aragon, and all those other places. So uh, what is the purpose of Columbus writing this stuff to them? And why would that color the things he chooses to write? He needs more funding. He wants more money. He wants more money to go back and to do some more voyages. So he thinks he's going to be worthwhile. And they're not going to check up on him, really. because How are they going to know, right? Not until like these people come later, like the, 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 the monks and the friars and the governors and stuff who come later, like decades later, to check on and see what's actually going on, right? It takes a lot of time to get that information back and forth anyway, so, you know. It takes as long as a ship ride. Once. Okay. All right. Now, we do have other things for you to read, so don't shut your brains off yet. Let's talk about context. So now that we have read something from Columbus's own point of view, which remember, we have to judge him according to what he thinks he's doing, what he's trying to achieve, and what can be reasonable for him to achieve at that time, given his context. So we're going to look at some things that fill in the context of his early voyage of discovery. So what else is going on? So it was really quite hard to find other primary sources from this time period that give you a lot of different points of view, but not impossible if you do a little bit of searching on the internet. But before we get to the written primary sources, I want to pull up one of my favorite things, the Ptolemaic world map. Now, using maps for this time period is just incredible, but that's a whole other workshop. Um, this is what Columbus and the other educated people in Europe at the time thought the world looked like. So you can understand this is why he thought that by going that way, he'd reach China and India pretty quickly. All right. Of course, India is enclosed. You see the whole Indian Ocean is enclosed in a landmass. This is all just more terra incognita. Yes, it does literally say that. Um, here's Africa. So you can see that colonial powers have already started mapping the coasts of Africa. And it's starting to uh, that coast and that uh, landscape is starting to get a bit more accurate in their minds. That means they're going there. Uh, Europe is fairly accurate. That makes sense because they all know Europe because they're all Europeans. Um, India looks kind of funny. Southeast Asia, they have no idea about Australia yet. Um, and so obviously, the Atlantic Ocean is a sliver. The Pacific Ocean is pretty much non-existent. And of course, North and South America are nowhere to be found yet. That makes sense. But your students need to know, of course, nobody at the time thought the world was flat. Of course, there are always some people who think the world is flat, even today. Even today. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. But no, Columbus and the other people did not think the world was flat. Uh, they actually thought it was just looked like this and was small. small, which is strange, because actually the circumference of the Earth had been calculated by the ancient Greeks to within 50 miles of its actual accurate measurement. So it's like, dude, the Greeks had got it right. But, uh, yeah, but, but, you, but you're, it's, that's middle school. It's what's right here. Middle school, that's, they, that, and that's, that's what they, that people, people don't realize what's in, their, what's in front of them. They only look and see what's in front of them. That's right, but Columbus 
And that they should have known that it was, but anyway, I, I don't know exactly why they thought the Earth was smaller circumference wise. Um, but yeah, and so Columbus actually achieved a new, broader understanding of geography, and that is incredible. And maps after this time period, oh my gosh, they fill out and start to look amazing. Okay, but your students have to understand, this is what Columbus thought the world looked like, all right? This is what they knew the world to look like just a short time later. So you can see already we have North and South America. Still don't have Australia, but we have North and South America, and we understand so much more. Look how much more detailed Africa is, for instance. Um, you can see the, the islands in the Caribbean. This sense that, oh, it's so much farther out, and oh, wow, there are lots of islands in the Pacific. Right? So this is a very short amount of time for people to expand their worldview this much. It would be like if we discovered a new galaxy and life on new galaxies, and it would just kind of blow our minds a little bit, even though we kind of had already theorized that life was out there. So this is what they're having to deal with. Oh, by the way, there is America. This is the first time the word America ever shows up on a map, 1507. The Waldsey Miller map. It's incredible, there's lots of resources on it at the Library of Congress, because the Library of Congress is very proud to have this map. Okay, so questions to ask when reading your source. What source? The one I'm gonna give you. We need to divide into four groups, and each one of you is gonna get a different primary source text from around this time period. Filling in that context again. All right, how about this? I'll just say, here's the, the Vasco da Gama, and I'll give it to these guys. Right. And you, please share, though, you might wanna pair up. Expulsion of the Jews from Spain. I have a lot more copies of this for some reason. If you guys want to grab that. Uh, whoops. This whole back corner is the papal bull that you were talking about. So here are the questions to ask when reading your source. One, how does this document shed light on the time period of Columbus's expeditions? They're not all from exactly 1492, that was impossible, but you know, take that into account. And then how does this shed light on Columbus's actions and attitudes towards the Indians? Because that is our ultimate way we're trying to get a historical empathy for. I had to really excerpt the hell out of these. They're longer sources with lots of, as you can see, complicated language that I thought would just be too cruel to throw at seventh graders and teachers. Uh, so I tried to excerpt these so they would be between half a page and three quarters of a page, which means that I left off a lot of really good stuff, as you can tell, because there's lots of little ellipses marks. That's where I cut out things. But you can also see that there's a link where these are each from at the bottom of the page. And um, two of them are from this really great website, um, the Internet Medieval Sourcebook. Uh, they also have a modern history version and uh, all sorts of, you know, all sorts of your ancient, medieval, other kinds of texts are available. It's all through Fordham University. and. Um, I'll let you take a look in a second if we have time, which we may or may not. So let's go through these each one by one and talk about how this particular document sheds light both on this time period and subsequently on Columbus's attitudes and how that played out uh, with the Indians. So the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. Now this is significant, 1492. You want your students to notice at the exact same time that Columbus is going on his voyage, what is happening? with Ferdinand and Isabella in Spain. Uh, oh, so uh, coincidentally, when Columbus is sailing across the Atlantic, Ferdinand and Isabella have won their war against the last Muslim state, the Islamic State, on, yes. on Spain. And that as a, one of the results of that victory 
is that they decide that the Spains will be a Catholic country, and so they kick out any Muslims who don't convert, and then they say the Jews have to go as well, and you have three months to get out of or convert of all our domain domains. Right. Now, to go back even further and provide context for that, Spain was one of the best mixed countries in all of Europe with this very vibrant intellectual culture because of the mixture of the Arabs and the Jews and the Christians that were there for hundreds of years. This is how we got most of our Greek learning uh, in the Renaissance was filtered through those Arab and Jewish scholars in Spain. Uh, so to bring all that to an end at this time, and it does tie into Columbus's voyages. It's not just a coincidence. This is the spreading of Christianity through the military and political arms of these very strong leaders. So we're, we can't be spreading Christianity to the New World if we still have Muslims and Jews in Spain. So how does this kind of maybe shed some sort of light on Columbus's dealings with the Indians? It was just continuing the work. Okay. Doing right. So all of this language about converting the Indians and about doing all this for the greater glory of Christ uh, that come out in Columbus's journals and his letters and his other writings. Um, I mean, yes, uh, in some sense, this did come from his own devoutness, but it's, it's a reflection of what his monarchs want. And so he is definitely... And what his way. monarch has done. And what they have done. Yes. So and even more than that, I think we, we sometimes miss this, that the bottom line is that these leaders have given themselves permission, they think, from God. Because it says here that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And, you know, so this is like coming from... Yeah. The creator of all things visible and they invisible. They are doing God's work. It is not even up to them to make this decision, right? So, yes, and this may or may not be a difficult thing for your students to actually understand, but this is a real force and a real thing in Columbus's universe. And we'll get back to that in just a moment after this next one. So Vasco da Gama in Africa, 1497. So Columbus isn't the only person exploring at this time. As we know, tell us about this one. Who had this one? Two people. This side of the room. All right. So how does this shed light on this time period? How does it maybe relate to Columbus's possible attributes for the Indians? The first thing I saw was in the letter from Columbus, he, you know, his intentions, he stated, were uh, peaceful somewhat, whereas these didn't seem to be the same. Uh, just the knowledge, I'm thinking, it could have been because of the, uh, when Columbus encountered the natives he encountered, they somewhat looked like him. So he's gonna treat them a little bit differently than what you're seeing here. And uh, how they relate and how they look at things. That's the first thing that stood out to me. Okay, so this is a bit of a different encounter with some natives and <laughs> Why is it that these natives kind of become hostile? Do we even know? Well, da Gama does a, a different thing than what Columbus says. He says in that last one, he says, all this happens because we looked upon these people as men of little spirit, quite incapable of violence. So they kind of underestimated the natives and were like, ah, oh, we'll just go in and do the same thing Columbus did and everything will be okay. No, it's not the same place. You can't treat all people the same. Yeah. And actually, I, of course, had to leave a lot out. There are some more peaceful encounters that actually echo some of the language from Columbus's letter, but I wanted this to be a different kind of experience. And I like it because they also, it also talks about this exchange. Um, so how, did, how is this exchange different? Yeah. Um, basically, uh, he figured, they figure out that they don't, they're not as useful as what the uh, natives were to Columbus. And so they start not treating them with respect. They start like 
snatching them up and they figured they show them their goods and they're like do you know where you can find any of these kind of goods and they say no and but the communication's poor so we kind of got a different little dynamic there all right Maybe the story would have played out differently if these natives had come wearing all sorts of gold jewelry, right? So the, the, the nature of the exchange and the actual things being exchanged have something to do with it. Let's go to this last source. Uh, papal bulls are always titled by their first couple words. And so the first couple words of this is inter chatera, uh, which chatera just the it's like et cetera. Et cetera is the same word. It just means other things. Um, so among other things, dot, dot, dot. OK, so this is 1493, the same year as Columbus's letter, where he's talking about what it is that he found. So what does this source say? Who had this source? All right, now you're going to have to explain <laughs> a little bit about the papacy. Uh, to your students in order for this to make any kind of impact. And also, what is a papal bull? Bull? Do you have an animal? What's a papal bull? It's a, it's a declaration, right? Yeah, it's like a declaration. It's like an edict. You know, this is what they issue. Uh, Not to be challenged. It means business. Yeah. No, no. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so this is Pope Alexander the Sixth. Yeah, I don't think your students have to remember that. But he's yeah. one of the Renaissance popes. He's one, yes. of the, he's one of the first to commission uh, Michelangelo to do work in that. All right, so they don't have to remember exactly his name, but this is the same milieu as the Renaissance, of course, which is another thing that she can bring up. All right, so what does this bull say? You have the Vatican's blessing. Blessing to do what? Um, to go there and um, convert them. It also sounded like they, the Vatican's granting all of North America from pole to pole to Spain, that it's saying that the Almighty God will give its wrath to anybody else that tries to go there for any other trade or reason. Yeah. So this is touching on this whole kind of, uh, all right, we're dividing up the world and dividing up among European powers as well. And of course, the Pope is, has power over Catholic nations, of course. And so not all nations of Europe are really feel beholden uh, to this or not. But Spain, definitely. And Portugal, of course, definitely. And of course, later on, you're going to get this treaty that divides the new world into uh, you know, different spheres of influence. Uh, so this is kind of setting the stage for that. And this one, oh, I hated to have to excerpt this. You can see all the ellipses. Um, there's a lot of really great language. But it's also because it's a very formal document, it is really a mouthful. So a lot of the stuff that was cut out was just get to the point already, um, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, why, how, why is the Vatican, why is the Pope able to just give this kind of permission over all these lands that it barely has any idea about. What gives the Pope that kind of power? Yeah, because what's missing there is how he also <coughs> gave them permission to kill them or enslave them uh, if they don't convert and to, in the previous one, the one 50 years, and then he says, again, in this one, we reiterate that. I'm, I'm yeah. Now this, this website, this website has some of the other things that you can look at. Um, and take their property and make it their own forever and ever and ever, yeah. All right, well, what, why do, I mean, again, what gives the Pope the power to say this? So you can see this, this is a really great site that has um, uh, a lot of these different um, things that go with it. It doesn't have the, the one that's, <coughs> that you're referring to. Again, well, what, why does this source have power? It's because it's the power of the Catholic Church at that time, and you're going to then okay. you then you get into you know Reformation and you know yeah. You may have to explain to your students that there is no separation of church and state here, and that the power of the Pope is over political entities at this time. It is not separate. 
Uh, so that's a concept that might be a little bit of, or a lot bit unfamiliar well, to your students. In, in terms of our curriculum, we might probably have our, you just said it. You've already gone through that? Well, you would have with like the feudalism, you know. It, well, we have ages. gone through the early Middle Ages where there was constant conflict over power right, and whether right. the church had the power or the monarchs had the right, power. The so, yes, yeah, so they're very aware of that. Okay, good. Good. Now, I, I am familiar with the seventh grade curriculum, and I don't know how that's going to change or anything in a couple years. But yeah, so let's hope that they still remember by the end of the year, because this is the last thing that seventh grade teachers are going to teach, right? And do you guys ever get to the, you ever get to this part? Any seventh grade teachers? Yeah. Good. All right. All right. I, and it's right after the, basically the Renaissance, Enlightenment, Reformation. Good. So the idea is that they will already have the context, but students can hear a lot of things and not draw the, the connections. So you want to re-strengthen those connections and be like, well, this is the Catholic Church giving them permission to do all this. So and all that is filtering through, and that is enabling Columbus to do what he does. So judging Columbus himself harshly by making these decisions as if he is doing it in a vacuum is not a really constructive way to look at history. It's he is being influenced by all of these different factors and he is actually answerable to a lot of these different authorities and so how does that make a bit more sense about his policies towards the indians which are different and kind of change over time uh, when he finds out that uh, <laughs> it's not going to be as easy as he thought okay um, now, there's a lot of Columbus stuff at the Library of Congress and things that we've already created. So I just threw some links together at the end of this uh, that can be helpful in talking not just about historical empathy, but about uh, just different, um, different aspects of that particular episode. Mm -hmm.